Okay. <clears throat> um, uh, good evening and welcome to the uh, June 14, 2023 Form Based Code Advisory Working Group meeting. We're holding a virtual public meeting today and all participants with us are joining remotely. I'd like to orient everyone to the virtual environment and cover a few specifics about how today's meeting will be run. Uh, today's meeting is available to join from the Form Based Code Advisory Working Group um, webpage. The county's events calendar and at the top of today's agenda. Uh, uh, additionally, there's a dial-in phone option for those who need it. If anyone loses internet connectivity during today's meeting, please reconnect with us by phone. Uh, please keep your video turned off and microphone muted until you're called upon. I'll turn off sounds to any other devices around you to minimize interference. Uh, these tools are located as icons on your toolbar. If you don't see this toolbar, try tapping or clicking on the center of your screen and it will pop up. When you're called upon to speak, uh, you must unmute yourself by clicking on the microphone icon that is located on your meeting command bar. The moderator does not have the ability to unmute you. And if you are dialing in by phone, please press star six to unmute. When you're finished speaking, please remute your microphone. Um, the meeting chat is active for participants who need technical assistance only and should not be used for discussion or public comment, uh, questions about agenda items, or requests for more information. All public comments must be shared verbally for the record during assigned public testimony periods. And additional notes uh, for AUG members, if AUG members wish to be recognized to speak on an item, please turn on your video feed um, and leave your microphone muted. And I'll use video feeds that are on as an indicator of um, who would like to speak. Uh, once you've been recognized, you may unmute. And once you've completed speaking, please turn off, uh, please turn your video feed back off. Um, and I want to ask, do we have any members of the AUG who are uh, with us only by phone tonight? It looks like not. I don't see any phone numbers. All right. Um, uh, <clears throat> then additional notes. Um, I don't think uh, I don't think we have any public speakers yet. Uh, um, but uh, uh, for the record, um, you'll be called upon to speak at the end of the meeting and you'll be muted when your time is concluded. Lastly, tonight um, this meeting is a public forum. Uh, it will be recorded and posted to the county website and all information associated with today's meeting, whether written or spoken, is subject to Freedom of Information Act requirements. Um, so then uh, I believe, Olivia, we are ready to go to our um, first item. Wonderful. So I'll invite the applicant to give their presentation and then we'll follow with a brief staff presentation. Thanks Thank you very much. Let me share my screen. Can you all see the, the PowerPoint? Yes. yes. Great. So hi, good, good evening, everyone. It's good to, to be with you all again. You may remember my name is Lauren Riley. I'm with Walsh Colucci and we represent the applicant for this initial uh, renovation phase of Barcroft, uh, which is Jire Lynch. And we've got David Hildy here tonight uh, joining me with, with Jire Lynch as well. Uh, you, may, you may remember we presented before you at the uh, at the April AUG meeting. We had filed our form-based code use permit in April and came before you to give you an overview of that of that use permit process. Uh, and just as a, as a brief refresher, while the overall master financing and development plan for the whole Barcroft site is, is underway, I know the county and, and Jire Lynch are, are working on that diligently right now. Uh, but in the meantime, we'd like to get started on renovating and upgrading some of these existing units in the in the historic Barcroft area. And so this involves some interior renovations, exterior renovations, landscaping, um, and some building additions as well. That's led us into this uh, Form 4.1.2 form-based code use permit process. And to, to show you all where we are in, in terms of the timeline, we've submitted that 4.1.2 form-based code use permit in April, and we came before you all to give you an overview. Since that time, we've been meeting with the Design Review Committee of the Historic Affairs and Landmarks Review Board, uh, as well as the HLRB itself in May to discuss the proposed building additions and their, their design. We've, we've uh, taken their feedback and under consideration. We met with the DRC last week to provide them some design updates, as well as to go over the scope of the exterior renovations and the landscaping. And so I'll go over that with you all as well in just a moment. And then tonight we're here before you again to provide an update. We'll go before the HALRB a second time next week. And then we anticipate that this use permit will be heard before the Planning Commission and the County Board in July. Then I've included a few images here just to reorient everyone to, to the Barcroft site and the limited scope of this application. 
So you can see here the Barcroft sites outlined in blue. Much of it is within the neighborhoods form based code. Portion of it is within the commercial code there on the on the west side. Here's the regulating plan for the Barcroft site. Again, the whole uh, full sites there outlined in blue. You can see that some of it is slated for redevelopment and then a significant portion of the sites located uh, here in this green shaded area, which represents the conservation area. And the, this area is intended to preserve, you know, not only the historic aspects of these garden apartment buildings, but also their affordability as their um, existing market rate affordable units today. And the portion of the, the property that's subject to this application will be here at the corner of South George Mason Drive and South Four Mile Run. This area is located within the conservation area uh, and it's not anticipated to be redeveloped. So we thought this would be a good candidate to, to kick off this uh, first renovation phase in Barcroft. And here's an aerial image with the property outlined in yellow. And I'll note that we've uh, we've rotated the orientation uh, so Columbia Pike in north is to your left so that we could fit the whole the whole property. The portion there that's shaded in, in red is the application area and it's located in a portion of what we call section three. This property has been divided up into sections based on when uh, when the buildings were constructed. And then on the right, you can see a more zoomed in view. This portion of section three that we're renovating uh, includes just five buildings, buildings 22 through 26, as well as uh, two garage structures that are here under these trees. Then with our with this form based code use permit request, um, we're requesting not only to uh, renovate the exterior of the buildings, you know, repoint the brick, clean it, replace light fixtures, windows, etc. Uh, we're also requesting to construct building additions on the backs of three of the buildings, as well as um, provide a new landscaped courtyard there behind building 22 to provide some amenity space for the residents. And in terms of these these building additions on the um, on these three buildings today, there's 93 units within the five buildings here in this portion of section three. All 93 of those units are one and two bedroom. And so through these building additions, the applicants able to convert some of those two bedroom units into three and four bedroom units so that we can provide family sized units in this area of Barcroft. Then here's a quick overview of our application requests. Uh, again, we've submitted that 4.1.2 form based code use permit. We are requesting modifications of the um, of the form based code to to permit the existing setbacks and parking spaces to remain as they currently are. We're also requesting a couple modifications of the conservation area standards so that uh, the building so that the window replacements uh, can be vinyl to match the existing windows on the buildings that have already been replaced, as well as to provide some new wall openings only on the rear elevation so that we can provide necessary ventilation for the upgraded uh, HVAC units. Then we've also included here at the bottom uh, a request for modifications of some conservation area standards to uh, to allow compliance with the Virginia housing requirements for tax credit financing applications. So when you submit uh, an affordable housing tax credit finance application to them, they were they have these minimum design and construction standards. They require entryway canopies, the canopies for all the entryways, and they also require you to clad any wood trim with vinyl or aluminum. And so you know, we recognize that that's inconsistent with the historic nature of these properties and Jire Lynch will be requesting a waiver of those requirements from Virginia Housing. However, uh, we've included that modification request here because we will not know the outcome of the uh, of the waiver until um, I think August or October uh, after the county board has heard these applications. And now I'll get into a few design updates to the to these uh, building since we last spoke. We've met with the DRC and the HALRB to discuss the design of these additions. Um, and you can see on, on buildings 24 and 26, those are the three bedroom additions. Um, the, the DRC and HALRB agreed with the massing scale materials and, and colors of those additions. We've spent most of our time discussing these building 25 addition here. These are the four bedroom additions. You can see there's another little piece that juts out here that's required a little more 
attention to detail. Here's the updated rendering of the Building 25 edition. Um, after speaking with the DRC and HLRB in May, we came back with this revised design that has this two-tone brick concept with a lighter, uh, lighter color brick on the four bedroom addition with the double hung windows, which we think is more architecturally appropriate for, for this addition. We showed it to, to the DRC last week and they, they expressed their approval. We'll take it to the HLRB next week. We've also been discussing the attic vents on the additions with, uh, with the DRC and HLRB. We had originally proposed with our April submission uh, vents that match these larger, uh, larger semicircular ones on the existing buildings and the DRC and HLRB expressed a preference for, for a reduced size. And we had also shown them this more modern, uh, modern approach here on the bottom. Since then, we've re we've refined the design. We've reduced uh, the vents to be this semicircular vent uh, that's you know speaks to the subordinate nature of the of these additions. We think this is more architecturally uh, appropriate for the additions than the modern ones. So this the top one is our our preferred design. And then as I as I mentioned, we'll be replacing a few of the windows on these existing buildings. So up till now. Uh, the, the previous owner has replaced almost all of the windows on these existing buildings with, uh, with vinyl windows. Um, there's a few basement, uh, metal basement windows that, that are existing we'll be replacing with this, with this renovation phase. And so we'll be replacing those with vinyl to, to match the existing ones. And then we'll also be replacing some light fixtures around the buildings with, uh, with ones that will match the existing. Here's our tree preservation plan as well. Some uh, some upgraded, uh, some new details on the, the proposed courtyard there behind building 22. So for this to, to the right, this preservation plan, you'll see the trees colored in green. Those are the ones that we'll be preserving. There are a few trees, some trees here in red that we'll have to remove because of their proximity to the building additions or their proximity to the, to the existing buildings. So they've got to come out. These trees here in yellow, these are invasive trees that we'll be taking out. And then these purple ones are, are dead trees that we'll be that we'll be removing. And then in blue, you can see that we're preserving this huge contiguous tree canopy here for um that's it's very valuable to the residents, provides a lot of shade, a lot of tree canopy to to this area. And then on the left, you can see some more details of that building 22 courtyard, some um some new landscaping, decking, and then um, some seating space uh, to provide gathering space for the residents. Now let me go back real quick. I'll just note here on this, this diagram, these two bars right here, these are the existing garage buildings on the property. There's just two of them. And so with this renovation phase, we'll also be repairing these buildings uh, where where it's needed. You can see they're, they're a little old, they need a little bit of love. So we'll be cleaning the brick, repointing the brick on these buildings. Uh, there's also some roof repairs that are needed and uh, Jerry Lynch will also replace these existing garage, garage doors with new ones that will match the pattern and the color. And then as I mentioned before, we've got those two uh, requ modification requests uh, for those Virginia housing minimum uh, design and construction requirements. This image here just shows you where um, where that vinyl or aluminum cladding would occur, typically occur on the buildings. It would be with these wood entry surrounds here and with the fascia board here. And again, that's if it's necessary, we'll be requesting that waiver from, from Virginia Housing. And then similarly, here are the two options that will be shown, the DRC and the HLRB for the required entryway canopies. There's two designs here that, that we're showing them and we'll, um, we'll, up, we'll update this once we land on, on the preferred design. So that's, that's the end of the updates that we all have for you tonight. So I'll hand it over to Olivia and then David and I will be available for questions. Thanks, Lauren. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Uh 
All right, there we go. Um, so staff has been conduct conducting a review of the um, this first phase of renovations in Barcroft. Um, and uh, the primary objective of this use permit, as Lauren just explained, is the preservation and renovation of existing buildings um, with limited additions focused on expanding 18 total units to three and four bedroom units. Um, so given that this is not new construction, um, and does not propose new units, the applicable neighborhoods form based code um, sections are limited to um, to these listed on the screen. So we're focusing on the requirements for conservation areas, um, allowable modifications, which Lauren um, stated are uh, for parking and setbacks. They're proposing to uh, retain the existing parking spaces. I believe there are 86. Um, and then the review process by the HLRB, which they will have completed um, by next week after this last HLRB meeting. Um, and then preserve natural areas, which I'll talk about a little bit more in uh, the next slide. Um, and then the conservation standards, which, which again, the HLRB is reviewing, will provide um, a recommendation letter on, on how those are met. So additional considerations that staff um, have been looking at are um, the South George Mason Drive study, which is an ongoing um, process and will inform um, some of the streetscape uh, design um, along uh, South George Mason Drive and along, I believe, a portion of South Four Mile Run Drive. Um, we're also um, tracking kind of the, the parallel master financing and development plan visioning. Um, to help inform the rest of these site-wide and streetscape improvements, and then just generally the community engagement process that is um, planned to occur uh, later this year and early next year. So we are looking at a condition that would require um, kind of the revisitation of all those site-wide and streetscape improvements to occur in a future process um, with guidance provided by the MFDP process. So looking a little more closely at the um, preserved natural areas um, here on the far left, you can see the neighborhoods form based code regulating plan. Um, the light green area is um, shows all of the conservation areas and then the darker green outline shows these um, preserved um, natural areas designated on the plan. So on this aerial, you can kind of see how that uh, preserve area follows this existing tree canopy here over to the applicant's um, proposal. This blue area here again reflects that preserved area. Um, I do want to note, I think you can see it over here, there are some slope stabilization issues and so some um, that process has begun to stabilize that area as I believe there's been some slides occurring right there so that's why some of that um, tree canopy has not been um, identified there. Um, so that that's kind of ongoing and on the side. Um, and then again, here you can see kind of the topography of the area, just the steep, the steep nature um, all, all along there. So these preserved natural areas are intended to be undeveloped um, areas characterized as having a mix of mature trees, dense tree canopy, steep slopes, other hydrological features um, or uh, RPAs. And then um, the requirement is to retain these natural areas in an undeveloped and natural um, state. So I think we went over the schedule. Um, I did just want to add that um, this item is proposed to go to the Housing Commission likely on, I think that that's scheduled for July 6th. Um, the Planning Commission date has yet to be set, but it's either the 3rd or the 6th. We're hoping for the 3rd so that we don't have a conflict with the Housing Commission meeting, um, but we'll definitely follow up on that once we have more information. And then the County Board hearing, um, we're on track for uh, July 15th. So with that, I'll turn it back to our chair um, for a discussion. Great, thank you both. Um, do we have any questions from uh, members of the AUG? I, I guess it looks like we've got Linda, Mark, and Michelle, um, but if anyone else is on, um, let me know. No questions from me, this is Mark. Thank you, Mark and yeah. Olivia, or, or not Olivia, Linda and Michelle. Yeah. I'm gonna, uh, oh. Well, Linda, I see you're off mute, but maybe you were just about to say you didn't have any questions. Yeah. 
No, I do have a bunch of questions. <laughs> Great. OK, um, four, four major questions. Um, the landscape plans, um, the, the plan looks really good. I, I really liked a lot of the things that I was seeing. Um, as you may already be, be aware, but if you're not aware, um, tree removal is a really hot topic in the county. It's about to supersede parking as the number one issue. You want to call a meeting and get people to show up, say parking. Well, now it's tree removal. So um, it was very clear uh, what you have to remove and why and that you're going to replace. And I think you said re remove 30 something and replace with roughly 70 something. Can you uh, talk about uh, where do the replacements go uh, in terms of the, the ones that are being removed? Now you're going to replace them. Where will they go? And, and just generally, as this um, process is iterative across the entire property overall, um, are there general plans for areas where you, you intend to plant new trees that are replacing trees that have to be removed because they're dead or for whatever reason? Thanks for that question, Linda. Commissioner Weir, I can I can take that one. We'll double check the plans. I believe the intent is to provide all replacement trees within this section of, uh, of the renovation phase. So within this portion of section three, we'll be replacing those uh, those trees. And like you said, Linda, we'll be we understand that um, that tree removal is a hot topic. And of course, we don't want to remove uh, any of the trees unless we have to. So we've been very cautious about identifying trees which do need to be removed either because of the decline of their health or their proximity to the building or or the fact that they're an invasive species. And we will be um, providing above and beyond that, that tree replacement requirement on the site. Okay, sounds good. My second question is about the stormwater water management plans. Um, sheet C18, the narrative was very helpful. Um, but what what is soil amendments as part of the landscape improvement? That's the terminology that you used in your narrative on sheet C18. What what are soil amendments that are part of landscaping improvement? So we don't have our representative from VICA on the call tonight. I believe, David, what soil amendments is referring to are areas where we kind of need to regrade um, to provide that natural stormwater retention. Though, Linda, let me confirm um, what that note means and we can get back to you uh, through Olivia and Matt. Have you identified in general if stormwater management is going, I would assume it would be a serious challenge because of the topography of this site. Is somebody focused specifically on stormwater management over again, because this site is so huge and there's so many topographical, topographical um, yeah top topography challenges just do you have any ideas for how you're handling the whole stormwater retention and management issues mark i saw you yeah, turned your, your camera on did you want to yeah linda that is something that is in. a high priority area on our, as we develop the mftp particularly since as you said it is a large site with a lot of topography a lot of the solutions are going to be site wide and not with any individual use permit. So we're really trying to manage that. So we have our stormwater folks working directly with the gyro winch team to come up with the best solutions. Sounds good. Um, my third question is, um, and maybe this is going to hit people as out of the blue. Um, are there opportunities for ADA ground floor units any anywhere in the property, not just in this section, but anywhere in the property? Um, since the, the building that I lived in uh, on Four Mile Run back in the 70s, what was underground in the front was walkout ground level for the first floor apartment um, in the back. And so are there ADA um, possibilities in terms of accessible apartment entrances on the ground, literally ground floor level? Is this something that, that you all are looking at? Yeah, I, I can take that one. Uh, yeah, Linda, we we uh, for each of these uh, sections that we're going through, we are doing a um, accessibility study. We did study this section um, in detail and trying to find opportunities to do that. Given the topography here, it, it, we did not find any areas that we could make it work with, especially the access to the parking and getting accessible paths. That's you know, kind of putting that, all that together. We couldn't find any locations here. We do think there are going to be some locations 
especially in the flatter areas like on Thomas Street and further down four mile run. So yes, every every section, our design teams are looking to maximize as, as many accessible units are, as are feasible. Sounds good, thank you. And finally, um, are there any opportunities for in-building bike storage? For example, possibly repurposing laundry rooms? Um, I, I, we, haven't, we haven't looked at that specifically, but yes, we do have, we are gonna have spaces in the basements. So I think that's a good idea and we'll look into that. Okay, thank yeah, you. We'll study that. And I know, David, you're also studying places where you can add additional bike racks um, outside the buildings as well. Yes, yeah, so we will so definitely we'll be, be looking at bike rack locations, especially by the entrances. Um, but I think that's a good idea on, in terms of in, in, uh, inside storage. That would be great. Thank you for looking at that. That's all I've got at this point. Thank you. Hi, this thank is you. Michelle. I, I don't really have, um, I think Linda covered a few of my questions. Um, uh, I, I'm I'm glad to see that you're like keeping the garages and refurbishing them. I just had a question. Were were I I missed a little bit of that. Did, were they considered historic as part of? Were they they're deemed historic and so you're restoring them according to guidelines. What are the uses of those or the, or planned uses of those? It seemed it was the last time we talked. It was pretty mis mishmash. I'm just curious about those. Right. So those garages are part of the historic bar crop. They are identified in the conservation area standards for, for preservation. So we are um, we are going to be making those upgrades to them. And in terms of their use today, David and his team um, through, through a recent survey have identified that these garages are indeed being used for, uh, for resident parking. And so they'll continue to, to provide resident parking going forward. Okay, thank you. This is Mark. Can I sneak in another question about the garages? Um, so the, they're used for resident parking. Well, also, you had mentioned while you were speaking that they were the, are those the only garages in the entire Barcroft or just in this section? So the, those are the only garages within this section. There used to be a third, but as Olivia pointed out, there have been some slope. Uh, stabilization issues on the property that resulted uh, in in one of those buildings uh, kind of falling falling down and no longer being usable. So we're working on um, on fixing that that slope issue. So those two buildings are the only ones within this section. Um, there are some other, uh, just a few other garage uh, buildings that are sprinkled throughout Barcroft. Yeah, and Mark, we will be talking about that with historic staff as part of the, the site wide studies. That is one of the the items we've identified to discuss those garages. Got it. Thank you. And I think that for um, Dad, look. just for the record, I think that this means we don't have any we don't have any public speakers tonight. Um, uh, Dad, um, so we don't have to decide Daddy. whether to take this one out. Mom, I'm, I can't look right now. Um, uh, so um, I believe unless anyone else has any other um, items for discussion or questions that we can move on to our next item. Ms. Sontag, if you agree, then why don't we do that? And, and thank you, Ms. Riley and, and colleagues. Um, I'm glad to see this moving along and this looks, looks great. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. We appreciate your time tonight. Yes, thank you all. Likewise, thank you. Um, Commissioner Aware, I just, um, I have to yes. jump out. I have my own planning commission hearing to attend and it's starting right now. So I actually have to, uh, I'm oh. going to miss the rest of the meeting. I'm sorry. So um, I'll okay. catch up and watch the video later. Thanks. Okay. So right. Linda and, uh, and, and Mark, it's, it's you, me and, and the gang. Was there a party and, and Mark and I weren't invited? I mean, this is this has never <laughs> happened before, ever. Right. Where and where is where is Michelle off to? What 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 planning commission is meeting does she have? Oh, the okay, right. The 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 one where the commissioners actually get paid. I'm sorry, I even asked. Um, uh, the the fair the Fairfax County one, I think. Okay. Yeah, well, I can tell you, if Linda weren't on this call, you would definitely just want to call it at this point because uh, <laughs> she, she's the one with all the, the knowledge and asks all the good questions. 
I try to keep my snide comments to a minimum. So, okay, I'll be quiet now. Well, I, I definitely uh, uh, agree with everything but the part about trying to keep the snide comments to your, I don't, I don't try uh, for that. So um, there's at least that. Let's, let's, uh, um, Olivia, let's hear about the RBL correction. No problem. Well, good thing the rest of this e uh, the rest of this meeting should be pretty simple. Um, this is truly a um, a kind of correction that we found uh, that's necessary within the commercial form based code uh, regulating plan to one of the required building lines. Um, truly, it was just a layer that was left on um, in the map and inadvertently included. And unfortunately, it requires the county board. Um, county board's review and approval in order to for us to make that map correction. Um, but I'll, I'll show you where it is. It's right here between um, Glebe and the proposed um, Highland Street and just south of um, 11th Street here. It's a little bit hard to see, but it's this red, this red required building line um, all the way up to this point here. And just for, for reference, the Exxon station is right up here. Um, and this area over here is where the um, Oxymite Village uh, was recently constructed. So this required building line, um, it requires buildings to be built right up to that line. So that's that's not the intention. This area is, is really intended to represent the kind of rear of development where height transitions would occur near um, this district edge, which is this dotted black line here. Um, so what we'd like to do is uh, just remove that required building line and it would just default to this district boundary and whatever the required um, setback is for that area. Uh, and then just to show you kind of the existing conditions here again, um, this is the Exxon site here. This is this the required building line that we're talking about and the district boundary edge. Oop, going back. And then just for reference, this is Oxymite Village. And you can see here at the rear, this is kind of an example of the intended transition area. Um, for this location. So once this required building line is removed, this is the condition that we would expect uh, when development comes in. And we do now ha officially have the, um, the Exxon uh, uh, use permit submitted. So that'll be undergoing its first preliminary round of review. Um, and they, we have talked to them, talked to them a while ago about this, this error in the map and they have, um, provided uh, a proposal that um, honors um, just this district boundary line without the required build two line. Um, so just a kind of quick summary of the amendment schedule. This is actually packaged with two other zoning ordinance amendments. So that art, uh, the re request to advertise went to the county board this past Saturday and was approved. Um, so we're reviewing this today. It'll go to the Planning Commission on July 3rd or 6th and is intended to go to the County Board um, on July 15th. Again, kind of as a package of uh, corrections to the zoning ordinance and then this form based code amendment. Um, so I'll take any questions anyone has. Hi, Linda. Oh, Linda, we'll start with you. Yeah. Oop, you're on mute. Can can you go back to the uh, drawing that showed the previous one? Yeah, just I was very puzzled. You're saying 11 single family homes. This is depicting 15 single family homes. Along. Where the red arrow is moving to the right, there's 15 homes, so I'm just curious. I just I, since this is in my our, our neighborhood, I wanted to make sure there isn't some other weird thing that might come up and bite all of us later on. Yes, no problem. It's probably a little bit easier to see here because of the um, Axumite Village redevelopment already. We're not including kind of the impact to these homes yeah. here, so we're just looking at these okay. 11, 11 gotcha. homes on this portion. Oh, okay. So okay. it is fifteen, but only but but four of them don't count. Yes. Gotcha. Gotcha. Literally don't, I mean, not like literally don't count, not figuratively don't count. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, my neighbors who live there will, will, yeah, I'll make sure nothing gets uh, transferred like that. So, yeah, okay, that, that okay. sounds good. Thank you. I'll make sure that's that's clear in the board report, too. So that's, yeah, because, that's a good catch. Because if I, 
going down the street like, uh, did somebody, you know, did, you know, did Mike tear down his house? The lot's been subdivided and, and or something. And now there's only one house where there used to be two or three. So I just want to make sure there's no problems down the road that come back to bite any of us. Well, I, I go, I, I, I go past that just about every weekday. And, and um, as of this morning, all of the buildings are present and accounted for. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We just don't want any surprises. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Thank you for asking that, Linda. All right, sounds good. Thank you. And it, it it really does sound like this is just almost purely a technical correction. Like it's almost it's a borderline Scrivener's error, and in, in that that um, that's maybe borderline might not be the right metaphor here, but it, I mean it's Come on. it's not. There you go, Daddy. We're not changing. Nothing's Daddy. being changed that wasn't. There you go. That, that wasn't Daddy. the intent Daddy. all the while. Right. Right. Correct. Yep, sounds good. Yeah, it just took us a little while to to discover it. So. <laughs> yep. Well, better discovered now before people start getting clever ideas on the in the application Daddy. process. Yes, right. Absolutely. As if somebody submits something with a required building line Daddy. right up to my neighbor's backyard Daddy. fences. Yeah, like whoops, and we don't need that. Exactly. Well, I, I would expect that that would I would expect that that would not get past you know preliminary staff review, but um, better to have it fixed before that before that yeah. needs to happen. Then um, sounds good. Yep. All, All right, right, Mark. If you don't have anything, then then Olivia, I think we're ready for um, for item three and 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 others. All right. So I before not, I, I pass this off to Matt for. Um, uh, kind of update on the overall kind of form based code um, uh, process since the the codes were first adopted. Um, I just wanted to look ahead to our the rest of the meetings for 2023. Um, we are planning to cancel the July 26th meetings. We haven't um, we don't have any items uh, scheduled for review. No meeting in August, um, but we do expect a a fairly busy fall and winter with um, the frame shop um, picking up speed. We'll likely see that at the September meeting. Um, and then we have Arlington View Terrace West, which will likely be administrative, um, but you'll still see that sometime this fall. Um, and then the Exxon station, which was just submitted, that'll probably be later into the year, or early next year. Um, and then I did want to, um, at Commissioner Weir's request, just give a brief update um, on the Elliott. Um, so uh, in our recent conversations with um, the developer, they are, after um, losing their kind of anchor grocery tenant, they are reevaluating those ground floor um, retail spaces, looking at um, potentially uh, an amendment to the use permit that would allow for just some smaller um, retail spaces. Um, but while they're still evaluating their their plan, um, they are they have been in conversations with the Columbia Pike Partnership and other um, just local businesses about um, short term leases for those spaces. Um, we also heard last week that um, the buildings were um, seeing some activity some graffiti that we were um we were alerted to and the building official did visit the site and had to um, condemn those all of those buildings there um, except for the cvs building um there uh there were some signs of entry um and just some safety concerns that need to be addressed um, before the building is um, safe to enter so the latest update we've received is that the um the property owner is cooperating fully with the county and they're working to um kind of make the building safe and uh, bring it back up to code um, so if there are any questions on that, happy to take those, but otherwise I'll pass it off to Matt for um, an update on the codes. Yeah, before we let Matt, Matt get going, because that's how that's how your name shows up in teams, Matt. It's Matt, Matt, and dot, dot, dot. So I, I have a lot on. of big names. <laughs> yeah, um, no, I, I have to, I walk down Columbia Pike a lot and um, the the graffiti and the tagging and everything is just crazy and that Elliot I mean that, that it's it's a disgrace so I hope that the county 
kind of moves with deliberate speed and working with the the um, the owner to to get that address. And I did just see recently that they have now all these big, lovely fluorescent orange condemned uh, signs on all the buildings, which didn't really help, but uh, it did to me at least say that something was being done because it's it's pretty much a blight. So that's just my comment. I second it completely. Right. Yeah, um, beyond the Elliot and, or the shopping Dear. center um, that we just talked about, uh, some key staff from the county um, have met with the Pike President's Group uh, very recently, I think a Saturday or two ago. And I think some additional opportunities for addressing this corridor wide, not just to that site, I think we're being discussed because we're hearing a lot of folks are dealing with third, fourth, fifth iterations of being attacked in that way. And even if I think people come out and paint over things very quickly, uh, the folks that are, I think, putting uh, graffiti up just continue to return. So I think beyond elements that the county can do and are in their control, when it involves private property, I think we're brainstorming actively uh, with our police um, uh, and the manager's office how best to address this, how to provide additional resources, um, and uh, just see what we can do. Uh, but it is very unfortunate that it's, it's starting to happen at the level that it is. Yeah, because it's it's coming into the neighborhoods. It's not just on the pike. Uh, if you go into the neighborhoods, it's 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 like any any flat service or available sign has got a couple tags on it. I uh, I don't have anything to add. All right. Well, I'm going to try to transition from that to hopefully what will be a more positive update. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, I can. There we go. Can you guys see that? Yes. Yes. Uh, although it's maybe this is just my monitor. It, it looks like something is highlighted. Mine looks. It was, in fact, better. just my, just me. Okay. Um, so hopefully this is for the present audience, but I'm hoping the other members who were not able to attend can watch this later. Um, this is kind of a timely update that we've pulled together with the help of uh, others, particularly in the housing division, who from time to time work with us on forecasting updates and monitoring development activity throughout the county, including Columbia Pike. Um, and what I'm hoping to do with this, again, it'll probably have a lot of numbers that folks can review later on, but um, really maybe paint uh, an interesting picture that puts a lot of what we do on a monthly basis into a better context, because I, I think we get into the pattern of, you know, meeting every couple of months, sometimes every month, reviewing these applications, reviewing a lot of these amendments, but not really stepping back to see, you know, what's happening with the bigger picture on Columbia Pike, particularly with some of the goals that we set for ourselves years ago. Um, and it's all the work that we're putting in getting us somewhere close to those goals. Um, and I think one of the reasons that we felt this was a timely opportunity is because we're actually in the middle of two uh, kind of important anniversaries. So. This past February, uh, 20 years passed since the first form based code was established, adopted by the board. And later this year in November, we'll be on the 10 year anniversary of the second neighborhoods form based code. Um, and that kind of gave us an interesting uh, idea to just kind of circle back and look at, you know, what's happening and what kind of strides are we making to the goals that were set for the corridor. Um, and I think as that's happening, you know, we always try to clarify, um, you know, a lot of the background updates that are happening uh, and, and what we try to do on the web uh, with our delivery of information. Uh, and a lot of these, I think, are really uh, a, a testament to uh, Olivia's arrival and being able to just take this on and, you know, uh, 
fill in a lot of the gaps that I think we identified over the last couple of months. Uh, and a lot of them are going to continue to happen over the next few months uh, as we get through this year. Um, but it is kind of making sure that all the information online is current, that the use permit conditions we're using are matching what the site plan conditions are doing. Um, and anytime somebody, I think, wants to uh, access current information, it's, it's readily available online. But beyond those updates, you all may have seen, I think, the typical development map that we track throughout the corridor, kind of giving a status of approved projects, projects on the constructions, active projects we're reviewing right now. Um, and I think that's all great. And I think it captures a, a really accurate account of what's happening. Um, but what I wanted to do is kind of piggyback and, and build on the, the table that usually accompanies that map, because th there's some interesting information there that I think if we can repackage, we'll start to shed some light on, on the progress we're making. Um, you may have seen in, in past presentations that this same information is presented in a more tabular format, uh, starts to look like this. Uh, this is where we also incorporate the retail uh, component of the project. So not, not just the difference between market rate and affordable units. What else are we delivering? And what is the status of those projects uh, based on where we are today? Um, so this is always, I think, an interesting element, just looking at the pure volume of density that has come across. Um, some of it is just approved and has been built, um, but I think the approvals alone, I think, speak for themselves, particularly when we look at the over 400,000 square feet of retail, for example, that um, the board did approve already. Um, but this is where I think we wanted to go a little bit deeper than just summarizing the development activity. And what we wanted to do is take a look at uh, what does this mean for the affordable housing goals that we set for ourselves on Columbia Pike? Um, and I think you all may, may be very familiar with this, but to anybody else watching or reading this um, as we post the presentation online, we did always want to remind folks that there's a very big difference between what we mean when we say affordable, particularly when there's a commitment that an applicant strikes with a county, <clears throat> strikes with a county to achieve a committed affordable unit or cap versus many of existing or legacy units that are affordable purely because of their age, condition, or actions taken by the property owner, given that the market that they're in. Um, and many of the affordable units, whether they are CAFs or MARCs, as we call them, uh, tend to fall in the 60% and 80% of the AMI category. So on the right side of the screen, you can kind of see what that means for different family sizes. Uh, I think this is a 2023 version with those income restrictions to qualify for a rental unit at that range of the household size and the average medium income. Um, but with that information behind us, what we wanted to do is focus on the neighborhood's area plan, uh, which is now you know over 10 years old, and what the goal for the corridor was at the time. So you may recall that you know we took a very careful inventory of affordable units, particularly the market rate affordable units, of which there are about 600, 6,200, almost evenly split between the 60% AMI and 80% AMI uh, rent ranges. Uh, and in addition to preserving or replacing them, uh, which either met our goal, we also wanted to expand the housing option to make sure that we were addressing all ranges of incomes uh, along the corridor and kind of maintaining that diversity moving forward as development happened. So the way we tried to memorialize that in that plan was through a series of tables, and, and some of these might start to look very familiar, but they essentially tracked you know, market rate units, which is what most projects typically deliver, and then a very uh, specific range of affordability that we also started to track um, and really emphasized the 2010 baseline. So what, what did we have when we kind of started that planning effort, uh, and what do we think we could achieve if after 30 years of building out this plan, what would the projects deliver? Uh, and this was kind of an interesting case study where through consultant analysis, uh, you know, discussions with property owners, we're getting a pretty clear sense of what the trends might be and the direction in which the market is going in terms of redevelopment, how some of the regulations that we put in place, particularly with the on-site affordability um, and other tools, how we might influence that. Uh, so another way of looking at, I know this is probably small thought, um, 
is looking at it this way, where what was our affordable housing projection by category? And you can see here that in the 30 year window, the horizon that we were looking at, there was a pretty significant increase, uh, almost predominant of those market rate units going from 1,700 to over 14,000 units. Um, we're expecting to lose just about all of the 60% marks, but expecting them to be converted to 60% caps. So it would not be a complete loss, but more of a conversion uh, as those became uh, part of uh, redevelopment opportunities or other interventions through maybe the Affordable Housing Investment Fund. And then you can see some modest increase uh, in the 40% and 80% caps, which the form based code does have um, some leeway in terms of allowing uh, adjustments to that requirement. Uh, and then overall, the uh, total change of units from 9,000 to 23,000. Uh, so what we wanted to do is take a snapshot of, okay, that's the 30 year forecast, but what, what's actually happened in that first decade? Um, and this is where things get a little bit interesting, but I also think positive. So if you look at the actual 2022 numbers, and these kind of capture the end of the year condition. So some things that have happened in the last couple of months are not part of this, but it is pretty accurate and interesting and telling in terms of what's happening with the market rate units on the corridor, but also some of the success stories in, I think, filling in those other buckets of affordability at very different levels of uh, AMI uh, and have we've been able, I think, to be pretty successful, uh, even given the fact that 1,300 units plus on the Barkov site actually left that 60% uh, mark category and went to 60% caps when uh, the county uh, and Jaya Lynch purchased it almost two years ago. Um, so I think this is a very interesting snapshot and we're going to be monitoring, obviously, how do these numbers begin to evolve uh, into the second decade of implementation? Um, because I, I think it's really telling of the direction we're heading and I think what the success of the form based code might be on the corridor, um, given it was a very big question mark 10 years ago. Um, uh, and one of the most interesting things, and I'll just leave you with this statistic, one of the first commercial form-based code projects, the Holstead, which is now the Avalon, at the time in 2004, 2005, when it was coming online um, or being approved, that was the corridor's market rate project, right? Brand new luxury units, if you will. Um, you know, fast forward to 2022, a number of those units actually qualify as 80% marks. So the addition of that housing inventory over time is helping, I think, what we always kept, you know, uh, advertising as, you know, more supply over time actually does help with the affordability. And I think the Halstead is one of those initial projects where we're starting to actually see that happen to materialize, which I think keeps that first number, the 1,557, lower than we thought it would be because over time, the, the rents do really fluctuate. And I think the addition of new units as we keep approving and considering projects uh, really informs that, uh, that pattern. And the last slide I have is just another way of visualizing uh, in the blue, you have that 2010 baseline. Uh, in the gray, the final column is that 2040 projection and what we thought was gonna happen. And in the orange, we're looking at the actual 2022 numbers that the housing division was able to pull for the entire corridor. So um, I don't have any questions. There's nothing to vote on. This is just a uh, an update of where we are uh, given the interesting year that we find ourselves in. So that's all I wanted to share. Thanks. Um, thank you very much. Matt, I, I'm gonna ask a question first and that is just help me understand, actually, can you put that slide back up, please, the, your budget to actual slide, which I think is a great slide, but I have some questions for you about it. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think it was slide eight or nine. Um, slide nine, yeah. So our first row here, um, market rate above 80%. Is this market, is this this isn't a, this 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 row isn't in, in, isn't for this doesn't mean affordable at market rate uh it it's we're not we're talking about just 
market rate of uh, um, units, right? Like might yeah, be affordable. Be, it's to anything from like eighty-one percent. It's anything from like eighty-one percent to one hundred and thirty percent. Whatever so, range of units that do not qualify for what we typically consider affordable. So it's it's not affordable housing. It's neither a mark nor a calf. Correct. Right. It's so it could any the, the units at Penrose um, or you know your your new luxury apartment housing is is would be included in this category, right? Mm -hmm. As well as something that's aging but not aging so far along that it that the price dips into what would be um, what would be below the one third what would be below the 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 threshold for a household at eighty percent AMI. Is, right. Am I right about that? Yeah. Okay. So then, tell me why the number of market rate units has gone down since 2010, because that doesn't make sense to me. That that I don't I don't make that make sense. Uh, some of it represents. Uh, a number of projects we received since 2010 that have been 100% affordable. Uh, there's a number of instances where folks like APA and AHC uh, have pursued farm based co development uh, in that time that has led to new projects coming online, but without really impacting market rate units. So I think the Shell, Gilliam Place, uh, Columbia Hills, Carver Place, um, probably one more I'm missing. Uh, so, you know, it's pretty significant inventory that alone in that window, um, I think, continues to add to the CAF inventory because of how those are approved. Um, there's also, I think, projects that were maybe in that first generation of approvals, predominantly in the commercial form based code. I know I mentioned the Homestead, but there's others that um, a percentage of those has over time because of the the rents and how they are uh, controlled, has started to slip into, you know, cross that threshold of eighty percent, and I think we, you okay. know, contributed to the eighty percent marks, um, uh, which is kind of how that number continues to be where it is. At the same okay. time, eighty percent marks that we may have had in uh, twenty ten, those values have gone down a little bit because the buildings are getting older and older, and the competition continues to be pretty extensive with new construction coming online and those have contributed uh to the 60 percent mark uh category so so part of it we, we haven't had any we haven't had any significant number of units taken offline what's happening is that that there's downward price pressure on stock on units that are older than 2004 and that are you know, what, uh, and and such, right? Um, is it is it the case that some units that were market that that were just market units have been converted to calves? I know that like I can't the Serrano would have was the Serrano at every point at any point ever considered market rate uh, before it was bought by AHS or by by AHC, um, or are there other buildings that might have been bought by um a uh like the what's the apple building at buchanan a complex at buchanan where, where would maybe those buchanan are gardens market, i think that have been, yeah that have that have that have been converted at wholesale because because I'll, I'll what i'm trying to then figure out is that <clears throat> there's i mean there might be a cascade effect right but like the number of market units has gone down the number of 60% marks, the number of then then the number of 80% marks has gone has gone down, right? So if if the market rate units are becoming 80% marks, um, uh, that may be that's great, but then at more 80% marks themselves have either disappeared. I guess they've been replaced by calves. I guess I guess the drain. I guess the there's a the spigot is units going becoming going from market rate to 80 percent marks uh but but the 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 drain 
for 80% marks is both becoming 60% marks and becoming caps. Um, and the drain is open more than the spigot is. And, and that's why that's why we see it. That's that's why all three of those rows have lower numbers now than they did in 2010. Um, is that did I just yeah, explain? Did I just very yeah, opaquely I, explain I, the situation to myself? There's several things happening. I think you're right. There is a lot of variation that's happening in adjustments as complex as transition. Um, some of this, I think, can be explained by the interventions where, you know, I know this probably didn't happen, you know, after 2010, but like Quebec apartments, right? When uh, those were purchased and made affordable, you know, committed affordable, or um, Buchanan Gardens, I, I think there was another one in uh, the Onsen Mill neighborhood, um, Sierra, I think. That was another one where there was some AHIF intervention there. Um, but I, I think just simply, you know, as decades continue to pass by, um, what we consider, uh, and I think what the market considers, a certain AMI category uh, changes drastically. And I think then we're also being very responsive to decisions by property owners and how they set rents. And what I'm being told by the experts in the housing division is that many of the complexes that have been built in that time, you know, they may have been delivered as purely market rate, but by this point, you know, a, a decade later, two decades later, they may tap three or four of these categories, partially market rate, partially affordable. Um, and it all depends on the unit size and, and what the competing rents are in that neighborhood or, or, or region. The, the thing that makes that 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 makes sense to me at a really high almost conceptual level only it the thing that makes my head hurt isn't the decline in 80 percent or 60 percent mark rates and it isn't even necessarily the decline in market rate units it's the decline in all three of those in conjunction that that like i almost want to see you know those charts where it's like it's it's arrows that move right and they get some of the arrows get thicker and some of the arrows get narrower as it shows how you know quantities flow from uh -huh. thing to thing i i almost wish that it were i i know that it's not but i wish that it were feasible to to get you know a, a graph like that that shows you know the movement of units from you know one row to the other um as per you know Per, per building over time or something like that. I, I, I have no idea how you would visually communicate this information, but it, it seems really fascinating to me, not just because of how far behind schedule we, are, we, we appear to be when it comes to the development of market rate units. That's a whole different issue, um, uh, um, and it is one. Uh, but um, I, I don't know, maybe those numbers just, they're, they're very, they give me Spock eyebrows. Um, no, it, there, yeah, there's a lot happening there, it. and I think we, absent of doing this on an annual basis, and I think having somebody from the housing division clearly explain what they're noticing and what their trends are, you know, the only other thing that to me starts to make a little bit of sense is when I look at, uh, I believe this might be the issue here, there's a number of approved projects uh, in that final column that are not reflected in that because the table that I ended with, they can only count those if there's an op operating building. It's been completed, there's no more construction happening. So we are sitting on a number of units, well over a thousand, I would say, that uh, maybe even 1500 that are approved predominantly market rate, but they have not been delivered yet uh, for a number yeah. of reasons. So I suspect- And this doesn't include, this doesn't include the Elliott either. Correct. And it doesn't that, that might make it a little bit more logical, perhaps, once yeah. those do get added. Well, and and it and it doesn't include the the any market rate units that are going to get built. I mean, they're not they're not even on paper yet that would get built at at Barcroft. So I know that there's a lot. I mean, I, I know that there's a lot happening in the next eight years that will move us towards that fourteen thousand number. But I said I was going to shut up. Thank you, Matt. Linda, you're on your your camera's on. Uh, building building on that, Matt, does what happened at the Wellington, if, if you go back to slide nine, does what happened at the Wellington 
factor into how the numbers play out at this point because it was totally market and then they've added and they committed brand new uh, mm -hmm. calf. So does uh, is the Wellington or any other examples part of the reason why you get what looks to be kind of weird until you start looking at individual pro pro um, individual projects. So th that was the first thing that hit me is the Wellington. Yeah, that's a great example um, because that's where I believe 105 market rate units to meet our requirements had to come offline and be converted to CAFs. Um, while I think what 400 maybe new market rate units were added in that separate building that's right. now operating. Um, so that definitely, yeah, kind of despite how difficult it is to grasp, because I, I also struggle with this, but it does kind of make that the table go backwards, if you will, in terms of projects are coming online, but we're not getting as much market rate units. Um, but I think that was kind of part of the, the deal that we were hoping to establish is that the distribution of the various income levels will be proportional to development. Um, I think it's very interesting to partly to obviously form based code regulations and development, but also I think just what happens over time in an active market that continues to add housing supply, right? What are those forces and decisions by property owners result in? Yeah, this is really, really helpful. We could probably spend a whole session going into details about how each of these numbers is arrived at so that people would, but it would be a really tricky conversation for the public at large because we would be so far in the weeds, but it probably would be helpful. And I'm certainly not going to ask you to compile numbers like this because what you've compiled is just tremendous over the years. But um, you might, we might just need to go through line by line all the lists of projects and say, okay, here it pluses, here it minuses, here it moves this, here it moves this, here it moves this, and that's why the bottom line looks like this. And and you may, and so you may think, oh my God, there's cause for concern. Maybe mm -hmm. there isn't cause for for concern. Maybe every all the different pieces make sense, and and we don't have you know an emergency on our hands or anything like that. Isn't it also a factor that um, because of economic conditions, we had we had the cancellation of the streetcar, we had a big gap where we had no submissions at yeah. all um, that we were dealing with for for several years. And so I would imagine, you know, this might be a graduate level course that uh, we would have to go through of looking at all the forces that took place in the last 20 years, some of which we anticipated and some of which we did not anticipate, like what happened in 2008 when everything mm -hmm. like boom um, crashed and, and then the impact of, of the pandemic. So um, just F, that's uh, my thoughts off the top of the head. This is really, really nice work. And I appreciate that you've done you've gone to this much trouble to do this. And I think we've got some room for for consideration down the road and the county in general will have some great information to work off of. So thank you. Matt, I, let, me, I will, let me, no, go ahead, sir. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. I'll, I'll pass it along to the, the housing staff that were pulling a lot of the, the, the difficult data. And if we do ever have a, a follow-up conversation, I, I would definitely want them at the table. Um, they, they, they live in this world. Um, yep, yep. I, I just repurpose it. Matt, do you think that the data exists to add um, to, to break the 2020 to 2022 actuals down by um, units built before and after a certain existing units and, and new units? So, you know, I, you could do this with sub rows. You could do this with with, you know, adding with with two columns and then your, you know, two two, um, two columns between the 2010 and the 2022, just showing like of the 1557, this many units were built before cutoff date. You know, maybe we use 2004 because that's the Halstead, or maybe 2003 because like like units built during the FBC era, um, or you could use 2010 since that's the baseline that you've adopt that you've that you've gone by, and because that that might just show us some of the picture, right? That might show. Um, uh, that might hit, that strongly hint at movement units moving from one to the other if there's a significant drop in pre-2010 stock, right, mm -hmm. um, in one category versus another. 
especially given that we know that it's not the case. We haven't seen housing demolished, right? We haven't seen units torn down. Um, right. So that's not a factor. It's all moving from one bucket to another. A thought, I don't, it would be, inter I, I would be interested to know whether or not that it would be possible to do that. I think it could be. Um, I, I, we'd have to check with some of those folks. Um, but what, what I've seen them produce, I think, was very detailed. Um, and I think with Olivia and I maybe sitting down with some folks, we could probably kind of get into the next level of detail for that. Yeah, for example, knowing where Barcroft's 1300, you know, if you don't know how to look at this chart right now on page nine, you'd say, wow, from 1120 to 3501. Well, 1300 got moved and yep. it's a big chunk of the 3501. So it's just trying to get some more detail, but still make it manageable for the general public to understand, do we have a trend in, the good, in a good direction? Do we have a trend in a, in a not so good direction? But because uh, I was going to ask, well, where's Barcroft? And you answered that right off the bat. It's sitting there in the 3501. So that's really helpful to know. But even that, you always bring up the good ones. Um, even Barcroft, you know, because it was a mark, and because of, I think how we're classifying them, it was embedded in the 60% mark category because that captures everything up to 60%, which may include some below. And I think as we've done a very detailed analysis of the resident uh, incomes that Jaya Lynch, I think, is you know working with um, as they continue their work there, we realize that it's actually a very broad range. I think there's uh, many that are uh, in the 40, 50% AMI, even lower. So my guess is and again folks would have to confirm this that 1300 probably left the 60 percent mark category initially and once the site was acquired it was probably distributed between two if not three half categories because of the range of income yeah yeah they've made it we very just, clear that they found out that there were a whole lot of people down at the 40 percent level it was not 60 yeah. percent so it's been quite an eye-opener for everybody we that's that's one of those things that if we if we had two more columns i'm not saying that this is the right way to do it i'm just saying it's a you know it could be a way to do it right we would see a, a change in in the number of pre 20 xdx you know like we would see that there are a whole lot of those 60 percent marks that were built before whenever that disappeared or we wouldn't um i don't know i'm not i i i'm I'm not. I'm not. I, I am not advocating for you to. I'm not asking for you to do this. I'm. I'm uh, I we think have a lot would, of free time. I, so I think. You know. You know, <laughs> well, it would be. It would be a. We, it. It. The question Linda and I have, and Mark, I see that your your screen is on. I'm sorry to keep talking over you. Um, is. Uh, I lost my train of thought. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna. Numbers will do that to you. myself, but I promise to stop talking and, and go to you, Mark. Okay, thanks. So um, I, I don't pretend I heard all the words you said, Matt. Okay, let me start. What I'm really struggling with is that first line, that market rate line. That just, like I said, I heard all your words and it's it, it, it sounds logical, but still, when I think about all of the new market rate um, housing that's gone on into the pike. And this number shows a decline from from 10 to 22. Just without understanding all of the dynamics and the, you know, the mark and the calf and the 60% and the AMI and all that kind of stuff, I understand there's a lot of complexity there. That still just makes me scratch my head. So that's that's just a comment. My question is this. Does does this is this a good is is this a good rep, not a good report, but does this bode well for the pike? It to me it does. Either it looks like our planning in 2010 was significantly off, uh, or what it's what it's saying is the pike is becoming predominantly um, um, lower market rate housing. 
So I'll start with the first point because I, I also had a similar struggle understanding the numbers. Um, one thing that helped me, and and again, until the experts chime in, you know, we, we may still be struggling, but I think it's really this slide here that captures a lot of the initial projects, right, that the commercial form base code delivered. And you can see the market rate column is consistently filled. Um, those were all embedded in the 2010 baseline because they were, I think, online by that point. And the 2010 baseline was really something that we monitored back in 2011, 2012, because it would have been after the census counts, so we would have had confirmed numbers. So those first eight or nine projects are already in the baseline. So we're not looking to add those. They're not going to be reflected in the growth of the last decade. Okay, that helps. We, that, that was one, yeah, that, that kind of helped. Okay, I'm with you a little bit. Um, and then when we started to look at the remainder of the projects, if you look at the very end, there's also a pretty significant inventory of market rate units that have been approved, but very few were actually built. Uh, other than the Trove and Centro, uh, we're still waiting for, you know, Westmont is almost done, but it's not really in the inventory because it hasn't opened. Um, Pike West, Stonewall Gardens, Bank of America, Rappahannock. Um, so all those units are yet to be delivered and fill that market rate column up. But what we have gotten, if you look at this middle section of the table, and in the very decade that I think we were monitoring, you got Arlington Mill, the Shell, you got Columbia Hills, Gilliam Place, um, and the Trove itself also contributed. So I think a lot of these are really what's being captured in that table. Yep. Yep. But even maybe in three or four years, if we updated, maybe at a five-year increment, I think it will look very different, more distributed yep. and balanced. And to your larger point, I, I think, you know, 30-year projections are very difficult. Um, and I think it's just, uh, if I were to go to this slide, if, if you actually find this page in the, in the, in the area plan, uh, beyond these little tables, there's probably like a dozen footnotes. Like this is based on this, and it's further sure. based on that, but unless something else happens, then it's based on that. So it just very convoluted, I think, series of uh, guesses that I think at the time we thought will give us a somewhat accurate account. Um, but it is worth, I think, re, you know, revisiting, and and this is kind of that opportunity now. Yeah, well, actually, that, that that what what you just said actually makes me feel a lot better about that because that um, with with those big ones that I was thinking in my head were already baked into your baseline. So okay, I, Olivia, I see you've got your your <clears throat> video on. I, I just want to make one point, and I'll go to you. Is that I think Linda, I think. Um, said the one of the operative words too, which was streetcar, right? Like the plan was that <clears throat> that buildings, the, the hope was that that developers were going to come in under site plan, right, and not under form based code, if I if I remember right. And like the Elliot wasn't supposed to be a 150 units; it was supposed to be a 400 unit project that was even bigger than Penrose Square. Um, it was supposed to include the southernmost two part buildings from Fillmore Gardens, right? Like there were grand ideas for what was going to happen. And um, those ideas might not have been correct. Uh, I mean, like as an empirical matter, had streetcar been built, but um, a lot of that 14,000, I think, was premised on the idea that we would be seeing projects that are grander in their aspirations than the 150 200 unit projects that 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 are 250 unit projects that are in the pipeline um, I, I think anyway, that, that uh, really is that's a very big big part of it because i don't remember any of the names but i do remember hearing that there were people who said no streetcar i'm not moving forward i'm not even going to submit anything and i can't mm -hmm. identify any names because it's now been so many years but there there unquestionably was an impact because people thought streetcar, yeah, definitely want to be here, and then it got canceled. I'm I, I'm willing to accept that our counterfactual world is one where the connection, you know, where where the connection uh, between streetcar and development proved false. Uh, but I, but the numbers were premised on like the the pro, the projections were premised on that connection mm -hmm. anyway 
Um, I don't know, Matt, if you want to add anything, but Olivia, I promised that I would go to you too. Oh, I didn't have any question. I was going to suggest we bring up this table. It is kind of oh, helpful okay. to illustrate those recent projects. It's probably the last time we're going to use it because we're running out of space. Yeah. <laughs> I can't fit another row in there. Can I ask a quick question about this? Because you kind of highlight the retail space. Do we know what uh, our occupancy rate is on that uh, retail space? We would have to check that. Uh, I believe uh folks that economic development should be able to pull that together and they have regular access uh, and, and, and confirm those for us but i'm not sure because because i think we're going to find i mean just anecdotally there's a lot of empty space so mm -hmm. and that can go to you know the transportation situation as well so yeah thanks this it's it's interesting to look at the numbers i I think it's uh, it's kind of fun. Yeah, Thanks once it became that. available, I think we just really felt we wanted to share it with this group um, and, and make sure that I think that next level of analysis was available. Uh, and like you mentioned, we can just keep repackaging it and looking at it at different angles. Uh, there's just so much to uh, kind of peel back there and study. Um, so yeah, very interesting. Can you pull up Fillmore? Can you pull up the Fillmore Gardens one more time? Is was I, am I wrong? Is that is that the Elliot? Yes. So um, I said that the Elliot wasn't on there, but I was. I realized that I was looking for the words the Elliot, um, ah. and it's been a day. Uh, yeah, I think we're using Fillmore Garden Shopping Center. Yeah, Number so 21? that is, so the Elliot is on here, but it it's it's yeah okay. So my bad on that, but it's still, it's, it, it doesn't change any of the, your point is, your your point, Matt, really is a good one. I mean, that's, that's a thousand units, 105, 411, that's 900 units between those five buildings. It's just 1100 units when you add in Westmont that are, that just haven't been built, that are approved, but just haven't been built. Or haven't yeah, been so, finished. Yeah, so That's I'm assuming good. you know the the pike isn't isn't considered a wasteland if you got that many uh, developers wanting to add uh, units onto it. So yeah, I, I think we we have one of the most diverse inventories of housing. Period. Uh, this I think was very focused on the filter of just income ranges. Um, I think you can make a very similar argument on just housing types typologies where just about any form exists along the corridor, uh, especially if you're willing to, you know, drive a few blocks away from Columbia Pike. Um, I, you just, you won't find it anywhere else in the county. Uh, so I, I think that that's also a, another piece of that is, you know, just valuing that and, and what does that bring to the, you know, market conditions and the way developers evaluate if they want to pursue a site or not. I must admit, I don't think this would take more than the, the actual uh, main item on the agenda. It also this but also it, doesn't keep going, the, right? Just... <laughs> this also doesn't include the um, the gas station caddy corner from Bank of America. Yeah, all the active ones are not listed there. Um, we, we really won't know exactly how many units they might have until we get to the near, near the end of the review. Right. So that. That's another thing is you might, you know, I, I don't know how much further you plan on sharing the, um, the, the, the slide, the, uh, the, the, the previous one, your, your, your budget to actual slide. I'm sorry. That's, I, I hope nobody actually starts calling it that. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, but, um, you, you know, you, well, you've got, a, you've got footnote two totals do not incorporate approved. Okay. I would I would suggest you make a bigger deal out of uh, I'm I'm talking about slide eight or nine whatever it is uh, or slide eight yeah. I would suggest you make a bigger deal out of footnote two 
in case any you know in case that slide starts circulating and people miss it um yeah i think it's like barrier on the bottom yeah yeah i mean it's if if you were to we're halfway through 2023 and that's and i mean that that number is it omits almost it omits almost the same it omits you know 1500 that's just not a complete story right like it's almost an above the line issue than you know than than a than a foot than a footnote because someone might see that and say well you know we're like 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 we did um it's almost like you want to add a 2000 column maybe before any former school development happened could we do no, no, a 2022 I'm, I'm about... and just say a 2022 complete and then a 2022 approved column? That might be a way of doing it. Yeah. You... Good idea. 2023 approved. Or After yeah, that, 20. That that's that's a lot of that's a lot of units, and it's and it's not just market. There's there's a couple hundred you know calf units that are in there too. Yeah, and keep in mind, uh, we've not even seen uh, what the further phases of Barcroft's visioning might include. Exactly. Um, and we're guaranteed, I mean, all signs are pointing towards development happening where development is permitted and envisioned by the code. So yeah. that could be a huge impact, um, you know, once we get a better sense of what they have in mind. It could be another 1,300 units. Well, I've said enough and I've kept us. It's it's now 8 30. Um Linda, Mark, if do you have anything else? Otherwise, uh, Olivia, um, I don't know that we have anything else. That's uh, everything just, in the agenda. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to Olivia for getting the material out to us before the weekend. It's really, really, really helpful to have the full weekend plus several days before the meeting. It really makes a big difference when we're looking through a whole lot of information. So thank you very much for doing that. You're welcome. I'm sorry, I don't know where everybody else is. Uh, this has well, never happened before, never. The cozy yeah. meeting. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know if this is it, but I was just thinking um, in the past, this is the first time that we've gotten the notice for the meeting from a generic email address. So it didn't like come from you, it came from like Arlington County planning or whatever. And a lot of times stuff like that comes into people's inboxes and they don't even look at it. I would hope that people on the AUG would would not do that, but who knows? No, it's, 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 it's a, it is a fact of life that busy, that people, you know, people look a second time at, at the email if they know them or then they think I've got that email from Olivia that I've got to respond yeah. to. Yeah, um, we just did. Like, we started like doing this job delivery <laughs> notices instead of just the the other form of emails just to start being consistent with how other commissions get their notices. But if you guys have any suggestions or still want that extra email, the extra layer of emails as a reminder, I'm happy to happy to do it that too. Be. Olivia, it might be worthwhile just to forward that gov like you could just if you would get included on that gov delivery notice to just forward that to us saying, you know, please just so that we have an email with with your name on the. Sure. Yeah, the, I think it would be re really, really helpful because I, I missed it the first time around scrolling through I just seeing because I get so much stuff, um, I'm uh, I'm subscribed to so many lists from the county, so it would be really helpful. And I hope th I hope that isn't the reason. I don't ha hope we don't have a whole lot of people tomorrow going. Oh my God, I missed the meeting yesterday. But uh, <laughs> well, I I'll also tell you thought, one well, thing. It's yeah, it's the end of school and it's graduation this week, and I kept ticking through. But everybody doesn't have kids, so I'm like, they can't all be at their high school graduation. For their kids so like where the heck is everybody tonight i don't know i'll i'll tell you one thing i i see an email from giselle if i don't open it immediately you know um there's a i I'm, i have heartburn for every you know uh for every hour that goes past um so <laughs> that's there are certain people that you just you know you expect to you 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 know that you've got to read their emails um 
So that <laughs> might be, I, hope, I, don't, I don't know if that's the difference or not, <laughs> but it couldn't hurt. It couldn't hurt Olivia. To, to do I'll start to be that scary person in your inbox. <laughs> <laughs> I did not say Giselle was scary. I did not. That is. <laughs> no, I'm no, no. We, we love Giselle. <laughs> yep. Can I ask a question about, and Matt, you know what I'm going to ask about uh, Woodmont? It is, that's what it's called, right? Woodmont Development, uh, Westmont. Yeah. Um, any, any information on uh, the retail space in that building, where it's going? Um, I is, think isn't there going to be a to... grocer in there? I, we reach, we try to reach out to their representation, and um, they said that they're still working with a broker, but have not really landed on anything yet. Um, so that's that's the best information we have at this point. Um, I will say that in the time since they were first approved back in 2019, I know there was an amendment. I think a year later, they've circled the wagons on a number of options. Uh, there was at least one grocer that was considered. There were other tenants. Um, it's a pretty prominent location and you got a transit station right in front of the building so a lot of visibility um i, I don't think it's going to sit vacant but I, we we're also curious on who, who's going to go in there well so all now has reported that um five guys is looking at it along with all care urgent care um but uh Maybe, maybe Matt, your circled the wagons comment means that that's that that's uh, uh, outdated news. Well, it, wow. it does, I think, match something we've heard a while ago, and it's been a minute that they did have, continue to have conversations with tenants who used to occupy that shopping plaza, and and some did express interest in returning. Granted, it, it would involve a you know a three year break where they had to find other locations. Um, but I, I don't recall if they were successful with any of them. Well, if five guys, they would be returning to their their roots. That's where they started. Mm -hmm. And I used to mm -hmm. walk over there in the 80s. Yeah, that and Brenner's yeah, Bakery. They, I mean, five guys, that was their that. original location. Most people don't know that. So that would be wild if they came in after they've expanded so dramatically. Yeah, they could, they could make a they could make a real space out of that. Um, but uh, yeah, room for several tenants. So if it's not like a larger element, you know, if they if they can't find a grocer, uh, you know, there could be several restaurants there. It's like at least twenty square feet available mm -hmm. from the pike. Especially several chain type or or fast casual type restaurants. Um, I do not want to be the reason that this is this has been an enjoyable meeting, but uh, we have, but if we don't have any more business, I don't want to be the reason that we're all um, held up. Uh, uh, so, um, Olivia, if you are if, if 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 there's nothing if there's nothing else pending, then I'm happy to say that we're adjourned. Go for it. So nothing until September, right? That's how that's what you're saying. Nothing till September. Okay. That's correct. Hopefully, but I'll, I'll send out another email to confirm probably in the next okay. week or so. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you all. Have a good all right, evening. Thank you. Right. Take care. Thanks, Take care. Good night. Bye. Bye.